things to consider when making a new design. So um, uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, what you're kind of uh, needing to consider and uh, what kind of look you're really wanting to uh, 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 create. And uh, basically, I think the very first thing I, I want to mention is you know your home should really feel like a home. I mean, when you come home from work and you drive up to your driveway and you walk up to your front door, you know, how does that, that feel? Does it really feel like you're coming home? Or does it feel like you're coming to the house where you happen to live? <laughs> you know, so that really we want to make it feel like home. We want to make it feel like a, a welcome place for the neighbors and friends. Uh, you know, just, you know, really uh, make a, a living space. <laughs> and it can be something very, very simple. It can be something uh, very complex. It can be a matter of a few pots strategically uh, placed in the yard and the porch. It can be a whole landscape design. So, you know, whatever your circumstances, it can be something. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, some uh, some guidelines to go with it. Really, uh, uh, landscaping and gardening are a form of art, really. So uh, you know, there's no hard and fast rules, but there are some great guidelines that can uh, can kind of help you along. So uh, what I kind of like to do myself is uh, you know I, I have a tendency to say oh I want uh, some color here or you know there's a bare spot here I kind of want to fix that up. But sometimes what I have to do is actually step back, you know, get actually get away from the door get away from the, uh, the spot that I'm actually looking at and look at the whole scene all together and really think about how does it look as a whole rather than just focusing on this one little spot how does it look as a whole does it affect the whole scene of the house and the yard and uh, I want to make the whole thing just really jive together instead of just being random panties here and there so trying to look for is that uh, the, the, the lines um, that are created by the plantings and the curves of land and the uh, landscape should uh, sort of draw you in, you know, kind of say, uh, come on in, you know, this is a comfortable place to be, come on in, you'll, you'll want to see what's in here, and rather than just kind of going willy-nilly all, all over the place. So I kind of think of it as a painting. If I'm looking at uh, you know, some uh, work of art, uh, you know, some artists, they go to school for years to learn all these little different rules about uh, you know, all the invisible lines and how the eye sweeps across the painting and uh, what should be in there as far as height and color. And um, basically, think of your house as your own work of art. And this is your canvas, and now you're going to start painting. And the very first thing that an artist would do is he would start with his canvas and the first thing he's not he's not going to do is start splashing on color. I know that's the first thing we always want to do is just go straight to the color. Uh, you know, I want something that blooms real pretty. I want pink. I want red. I want this. I want that. But really the first thing you want to do is uh, you know, imagine that you've got your house and then start thinking about form. So just like an artist would start by taking a pencil and he, you know, put in the house and he put in the trees and the curves of the land, and then he would start filling in the color. You want to basically do the same thing. So, uh, um, so you'll step back. How best thing to do is step all the way back out to the street and look at it as a whole. Walk in uh, towards the front door, go up the path or the driveway, uh, come up to the front door. You know, see what's on either side of the path, but. How does the door look? Go from there. So really, you want the, uh, everything to just draw you in. So um, uh, let's see. So uh, you know, you're gonna think about uh, where you need height, where you need height, uh, where you need uh, low cover, where you need ground cover. Uh, you're gonna need to make a list of all the necessities. So it's not all just fun. There are gonna be times where you need erosion control, privacy screening, uh, something to block the utility box, you know, things like that. Keep all of that in mind. Make a list of uh, what you have. Make a diagram of your, 
your home, uh, sometimes from the, the top, and I also like to make one from the front, so I know what it's going to look like from here, but I also need to know, uh, having a, a diagram of the, the property from above, and then making notes of what's in the shade, during what hours, and then you need to choose your plants accordingly. So, <clears throat> um, decide whether you need uh, trees for shade if you plan on spending time outside, or maybe trees to shade the house, uh, you know, different, different necessities, and then also figure out how you want this to look ornamentally. You want shapes and heights that are going to work with the house, not be blocking its best features, but rather framing it. Uh, sometimes I, I walk into a yard and the very first thing that I hit is this great big photinia. <laughs> it's huge. I mean, just massive. And uh, it's, it's blocking right in the middle of the view. Right in the very, very middle. And then I, I walk around that and then I see just random bits of color here and there. Just things that were planted kind of over the years, accumulated. I'm doing a lot of this. That's a pretty color. Ooh, that's a pretty color. And it's all down here. All the color seems to be sprinkled at the very, uh, uh, on, the, on the ground. And uh, really what we want to do is get some height in there, bring the eyes up, so that when we look at it, at the scene as a whole, we're <coughs> really seeing the beauty of the home, instead of just having some, you know, petunias planted on the ground. So, uh, you know, really uh, when you're planting, the very first thing you want to do is look at your height, trees and shrubs. Those are sort of the backbone of the, uh, the structure, the, the skeleton of the structure. This is also the part of, of the structure that may uh, continue through the winter when some of the flowering things go dormant. Uh, you know, what's, what's still standing up tall is really going to become uh, the landscape itself. And then during the summer, it's going to, uh, like I said, raise the eyes up and really give everything form so that it's not just a random smattering of color. Um, working here in the garden center, you know, uh, people come in with all sorts of different issues. I've got to get a plant for this spot, I've got to get a plant for that spot. And then some people come in, I, you can always tell, they're the ones that come in with the clipboard <laughs> or the tablet. You, that means they're doing the whole yard all at once. <laughs> so uh, and they come in and I've got to start from scratch here and what do I do? And so whether you're, you're doing it from the beginning or just kind of adding to the existing, there's so much uh, you can do with planning that will really help planning ahead, will solve so many of your problems later on. So uh, you know, we want to choose our plants accordingly to you know, what we're going to need and how they're going to look in a few years from now. You want to ask yourself, what do I want this plant to look like five years from now? What do I want to be doing with this plant five years from now? Do I still want to be trimming it? Or do I want to buy something that is going to stay small? Uh, do I still you know, uh, want to have uh, high maintenance or low maintenance yard? Am I going to be able to adjust the irrigation uh, as, it, uh, as it grows and as the needs of the plant change? So we're going to uh, address all of that today. Um, um, I was kind of uh, thinking, I knew some of you have come from different uh, situations. Are there any questions or main concerns that we're trying to address today that anybody would like to ask? Okay. So let's go into just some, uh, you know, basically, so choosing the plants. We'll go into that first. And, uh, let's see. Um, uh, basically, you want to start with your trees and shrubs. I didn't bring a lot of trees up here with me, but <laughs> uh, you kind of want to start with your style. You know, if you were to say, yeah, <laughs> this is a handsome maple. This is actually a Japanese maple. Uh, this one does need to be in the shade. It can't take our, our dry heat here, so that one uh, may not be in the very middle of the yard, but it can be right up there at the doorway. I love seeing tall things right by the doorway. It just really creates an entrance, uh, you know, Part of the first impression of home, and uh, it makes it really feel like a home. And you're just framing the door. So rather than uh, you know, often I come up to a door, and you've got you know a nice door, maybe some windows inside, and there'll be this tiny little pot mm -hmm. right there in the corner. <laughs> Always seems to be like a, an afterthought. <laughs> uh, 
uh, pots and statues especially always seem to be afterthoughts and we want to actually think of those as part of the whole, the whole landscape. So by all means, get something tall next to the door. It can be a small tree, a tall shrub. It could be even a pot of plant with something tall in it. Uh, but uh, the main thing you're probably all here for is really thinking about the entire landscape as a whole. And, uh, you know, Rich and I got to talking uh, yesterday about uh, some of the things, the, the main concerns that keep coming in for, from our customers and uh, problems that they tend to deal with, uh, especially when they've just moved into a house that somebody else landscaped. And uh, one of them is, you know, what gets planted in the yard and where? Uh, big trees right in the front yard. That can be a great thing. I love to see big trees in the front yard, but it can come down to which tree got planted. Sometimes you come in and there's this giant, uh, it could be a blue spruce, and it's just, you know, huge, and it's kind of a cone shape, so you end up with this big triangle in the yard, and you've got the house, and a big triangle in the yard, and, you know, just like when you're dealing with a painting, they tell you always look at the lines, where do the lines lead the eye? Is that leading the, the eyes away from the door? You know, if you've got the door here, then the, the lines of the spruce are kind of leading up like this, away from the door. And that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So sometimes uh, strategic plantings can make a whole lot of difference in the overall look of the yard. Uh, again, uh, you know, large uh, shrubs they can get massive after a few years. And so you always want to think about what's that going to look like when it gets bigger. Sometimes they're real cute when you first put them in. And then years later, it just kind of went way up here. And now it's doing something completely different to the yard. And it's fine to plant big plants like that if you're planning on trimming, but sometimes uh, you want to you know, kind of scale it down. Uh, and you can absolutely control just about anything with trimming. Uh, I get that question a lot. I love this tree, but it's too big for my space. Can I do it? Well, yeah, you, you actually can. Uh, but it is one of those things you've got to plan ahead. How much work do I want to put into that? Even more common, really, that I see is uh, someone coming in and they're afraid to put anything high in there. You, know, you do need some height, and uh, they're they're afraid to try to do anything drastic. Uh, you know, they're just not sure they want to try that, or sometimes they think it's going to block a view. And uh, someone will come in and say, "I need something uh, real low." Okay, how? Uh, what's our height maximum that we're allowed to go? I, I'll help you find a plant, and uh, you know, uh, we'll we'll find something that stays within that height, and they'll say four inches. <laughs> 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 I guess it's almost every day. Uh, they really think that anything over that is going to block the view. <laughs> and I know that sounds funny, but they really think that, especially if it's going to be, you know, kind of near what's basically the horizon or the highest part of the slope or, uh, on the land or something. And they think anything taller than that, it is, it's going to be too tall. And they have trouble finding something within that size. And uh, then they'll see something out in our landscaping or by our our gate and they say, I love that, that would be perfect, how about that? Well, that's actually 12, maybe 14 inches. Plants always are taller than you really think they are. Uh, so you know, sometimes it's good to uh, get some perspective. Uh, you might actually want to ask a friend or a spouse to go and stand in the spot where you plan on putting that plant and see what, uh, where your line of vision behind him actually ends and uh, he says, oh, I, I can see you know, everything uh, over your waist just fine, so we don't want to plant anything more than this high. And you know, maybe that was much higher than you thought you could go, but you actually have more room than you thought you did. So uh, height is good when placed strategically, and uh, you, you don't have to, to worry about uh, uh, the plants getting as out of control as you thought. So sometimes it's good to measure because what our eyes think they're seeing, it's not quite what's really there. So um, uh, some of you are going to be putting up uh, uh, privacy hedges and windbreaks. Uh, you might be putting that, uh, you know, along the sides of your home, uh, maybe along the fence line. Uh, things like that. You know, you'll be getting some instant height there. You may be putting something, a big tree, in front of the house. And so you think, uh, I, I just have to have something that size. And uh, that doesn't leave much room for creativity. And actually, there is. Uh, so you know, there are things with different colors, different heights. And nobody 
said that you have to plant a perfectly straight row of trees along the property line to give you a privacy and windbreak. There's nothing that says you can't stagger that a little bit or stagger the heights a little bit. Uh, you know, there are times when straight lines work for a yard and uh, they're used strategically, but sometimes straight lines can be a little more strict looking, a little harsh, uh, or maybe lead the, lot, the eye in the wrong way. You know, don't be afraid to kind of zigzag those a little bit and, and stack with them when you place them. And also thinking about the size that they're going to be. Uh, ground covers. Uh, again, getting into that height issue, everybody says, oh, I, I'm sure we can handle anything over two inches, four inches, six inches, and uh, sometimes I, I actually uh, like to go a little bit higher. Some of you may have been to Lisa's uh, uh, potting class, where she tells you uh, how to make those beautiful pots that she makes and puts out in the front, uh, and she always gives you three rules, uh, thrill, fill, and spill. Um, kind of actually works in the yard, too. And uh, you know you, you always have a a plant. Or this one's convenient. I'm just going to grab it. So it doesn't have a lot of height, but it does have a spill. That's where it spills over the pot. Same thing kind of actually happens in your yard. Uh, you know this. It's it's always the finishing touch. Uh, whether you're seeing a weeping willow with something, you know the the, the leaves trailing down. Whether it's a retaining wall with the vines cascading over it, uh, something about that cascading, spilling effect is just pleasing to the eye. And you do it with the pots, and you can actually get that on the ground, believe it or not, and even especially in slopes, but even on flat ground, by strategically choosing your plants, uh, you know, plants that either have a, a sort of arching effect or going with ground covers that are just a little bit higher. So rather than this, you maybe get something that's one and a half, two feet tall, and you'll find that it tends to have this effect that it's sort of spilling over the ground. It, it just works. Uh, and then having the, the more the tall, your thrillers, having your uh, shrubs, your trees, uh, tall vines, you know, making those your thrill, then you want to put in the fill. I find that the filler tends to get missed a lot. A lot of the, uh, um, Classes will have tall tree, ground cover, nothing in between. Maybe a bed of flowers up by the house, again very low, and that filler, uh, in the yard I find it's a filler that tends to either get missed, and, or it'll be up by the house and it'll be thrilled at the height that gets missed. And uh, so, you know, you can have something in between so it's not just green here and then green up here and then that's it. So uh, you know, have some shrubs in there, and there's so much that you can do with the color, not just flowers, but you know, uh, colorful foliage. So we might want to go with something like this. And we'll put something tall in here, and you put something a little bit shorter right next to it, and think, okay, this that works. And then you put something, uh, you know, kind of in front of it like that and uh, you know you, you get more of an effect here uh, having this tiered uh, terraced effect you'll actually get more visual um, you know the your eyes are not forced to just stay on the ground you can actually look up at the scene as a whole but there's still color all the way around sometimes though you do have to consider where I'm going to be in the winter uh, it's things like um, you know, you've got spots that in the winter time you don't go out there much. It's too cold. But if you've got a spot that you tend to see a lot in the winter, maybe it's the front of the house, maybe you're seeing it through the window a lot, you might want to consider. So this one's a deciduous. It's going to turn to sticks in the winter. You lose its leaves, it's not going to look too pretty. And if that's going to be an issue, we'll change it out. We'll put something else in. So we might go with a Evergreen. A lot of people think that evergreens are conifers, that means needles, and that's actually that's not true. We can put in. Um, let me try this. I brought up a random assortment of flowers and plants up here, so let's see what we've got going on. Now, here, this is actually evergreen. So, this is something that's going to look pretty all during the, the winter. 
Now, not, you may not necessarily make the entire combination uh, evergreen. Is this a coquilla? This is a silverberry. Ah, yes. okay. This is, this is silverberry. Uh, a lot of people consider this to be the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the alternative to uh, euonymus. Euonymus is very popular here. It has beautiful, uh, the golden euonymus has beautiful uh, gold-edged leaves, and so does the gold spot euonymus, uh, which is also evergreen. The silverberry uh, happens to be a drought-tolerant, uh, low-water user, almost needs no care. Uh, this one here, too, uh, this is a butterfly bush up here, again, low-water user. This one is deciduous. This one you actually cut all the way back in the winter, and uh, that would be fine. Uh, that would be fine with, for me, at, at least. So even though I won't see this during the winter, at least the tallest thing is going to be evergreen. And, uh, you know, he'll, uh, like I said, it, it kind of brings your eyes up and you're not paying as much attention to what's missing when the tallest part of the planting is still there and not just looking like sticks. And this gets cut back and then it comes back um, in, um, in the, the spring, turns green again, grows up really, really fast, and then blooms all summer and all the way up into frost. And if I wanted to, I can even take this hawthorn, stick it in that same planting. So I've now got uh, my evergreen here. It's uh, tall. And then I've got a kind of a medium-sized plant here. Uh, this one will grow around, uh, I think, uh, two, two and a half feet. This one blooms in the spring. So we'd have some pink against the yellow in the springtime. This is another evergreen. And then... In the winter, you wouldn't notice so much that there's a, a plant missing. But then, after this is done blooming, our butterfly bush starts blooming for the summer. So we've got a spring bloomer and a summer bloomer and something evergreen for the winter. So we've now got all three seasons without, uh, you know, having to just look at dead sticks for part of the year, sometimes for, you know, four to six months depending on what you plant. So we can actually plant strategically so that we have four seasons of color. How tall does the silverberry get? The silverberry will reach about six feet, okay. uh, fairly fast growing, uh, extremely low water user. This is a great one for those of you that have a little trouble getting irrigation out to certain areas. Um, it can make a head high privacy hedge. Um, and then uh, the Indian hawthorn is another low water user. And uh, again, evergreen. Takes the heat great. Both of these really take abuse great. Uh, <laughs> I've seen them seriously neglected and they just keep going like nothing ever happened. It's amazing what they take, especially after they've been established. Uh, they, they almost need no care at that point. When, they're, when they've been in there for years, really, <laughs> that's what I want. Really do great. So these plants, you, know, you, you plant strategically, so uh, you want to have uh, an idea of what it's going to look like now, but also in the future. And another big thing is, uh, you know, what care is it going to need in the future? Yes? I've got existing 100-year pine trees. Okay. So I've got the tall. Okay. What Very I, tall. Very tall. What Very tall. What do to fill those in? Okay. So a lot of you um, actually live on the west side of town. Big, tall pine trees, yeah. <laughs> a lot of you are up there. And then some of you are way out of you know, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, and it's all flat. And so, yeah, yeah there you go. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're out there in those tall pines, uh, or if you just have, you know, existing trees or something on the property you don't want to remove, somehow incorporate that into the plan. You might decide to make it the height. You might decide to make it the filler. It just kind of depends on what is really going to work best with that house and with that yard, depending on you know, what part of the area you are actually doing at this point. So uh, some of those trees, like uh, the ponderosa that we have here, they're 60 feet tall, very tall pines, almost kind of just disappear in the background. Uh, sometimes they need um, something very tall for their filler and then maybe another, uh, you know, so basically a, another height kind of bring the eye level down a little bit and then start going in with shorter fillers and spillers. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, you can work with what's already there. There are times when you've got something that's, you know, very difficult uh, that 
you might decide has to go. You know, everybody kind of comes at this with a different uh, point of view. Some people hate to cut things down. Oh, to have to cut anything living down is just the worst thing ever. And who wants to cut down a tree, really? It, it, I think it's almost instinctual to not want to have to cut down a tree. Nobody wants to do it. And then others just kind of view it as, hey, you remodel the inside of the house, why not the outside of the house? And they'll change out the trees every so many years. <laughs> so everybody's a little bit different on, on uh, whether you can take a chainsaw to a tree or the landscape or whatever. So that's going to be your choice, whether to incorporate or to remove and start over again. And that's up to you. Uh, definitely, um, I can do something. But definitely you want to uh, plan ahead for the care of your uh, landscape. Uh, quite often, this happens uh, several times a day, really. People come in, they've got a problem with a tree or something in the landscape. Hmm. It can be some of the smaller plants because often it's the trees. Uh, they come in and they're having an issue and it's uh, probably 99% of the time it's a water issue. You know, sometimes you see bugs, once in a while we get fungus, uh, but really 99% of the problems that I have to diagnose every day are water issues, and it was because of poor planning, sometimes from the previous tenant, and uh, now the current tenant got stuck with the problem. Uh, you come in, uh, let's take for example quaking aspen, very popular tree here. Uh, you come in, I want a quaking aspen. They're beautiful. I see them around the neighborhood. I just got to have one. Is that something that you're willing to dedicate yourself to? The best thing to do when you're buying a tree really is to come into the garden center and ask, what kind of watering is this plant going to need when it's mature? Uh, you know, now it's small and cute and easy to take care of. One day it's going to be a great big tree and it's going to drink like a lumberjack. <laughs> And you need to know how much water you're going to need to plan for. And is that something you really want to dedicate your resources to? And I see this so often. And a lot of times you come in, you, a lot of you just bought new houses. And that's why you're here. You want to you know, kind of landscape. Are you willing to dedicate yourself to, say, 30 gallons a week? 65 gallons a week? Are we getting out of your comfort zone? You know, if, some of you have uh, wells or you have plenty of water and you say, you know, I can handle that as long as it's just one tree. You also have to consider how many of these trees am I going to be getting? Am I willing to dedicate 30, 50, 70 gallons of water to each tree in the yard, especially those of you that have big properties? Are you willing to do that? So some of you may say, yes, I can handle it. Some of you might say, you know, I can't do that. Um, so that's something that tends to get overlooked when someone's buying a tree or deciding on what trees to put in the yard. Uh, <clears throat> you know, aspens are, are beautiful, but maybe we can find an alternative. Um, maybe you'll be comfortable with the aspen, but you might want to look over, say, the globe book. You know, that's a, when mature, we're talking 65 to 75 gallons a week on a globe book or a weeping willow. <laughs> they need water. How many of those do you want to put in your yard? You might be comfortable with one, but are you sure you want to put in a whole row? Someone came in yesterday and the contractor had put globe willows on all the houses on that street. <laughs> Several. <laughs> and uh, there's a few streets that are like this where the contractors, knowing that globe willow is a very popular, uh, very beautiful tree, put the globe willows in every yard, the whole neighborhood. And now the tenant is like, what's going on with it. It's got slime flux, I don't know what's wrong. And it came out to be a watering issue. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it does sound bad. And you know, it's kind of gross, it starts oozing slime. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's always caused by dehydration, which uh, lowers immunity, and then it gets this disease called slime flux. I'm yeah. the impression the average tree once it's been in the ground a year or two, it really doesn't require a whole lot of water. That depends on the tree. And many trees, uh, you know, they, as they age and get bigger, yes, their water needs uh, <clears throat> become less frequent. Uh, you know, some of them, they need a good big drink, but they only need it every other week, every month, sometimes just during the dry spells, and that's it, and they're good. 
And the bigger they get, the less care that they need. But there are some trees that don't do that. So you want to know ahead of time, before you plant it, what is this tree going to cost me five years down the road? Is it still, is it going to uh, let up on the water or is it going to need more? And some trees like aspens and willows, the bigger they get, the more water they need. <laughs> and then you have others like ashes and locusts that the older they get, the less they need, and they kind of get to a point where you're just watering them during the dry spells. Yes? How do the ashes do here? Um, the ashes actually do great here. Yeah. They're, they are. Uh, they're uh, kind of a true. I don't like very many around. Are they not very common? Um, you probably see more than you realize and just didn't realize that's what it was. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, <laughs> there's a quite a few different ashes, actually. Uh, uh, we've got Purple Mountain and, and Coral Fire, we've got Raywood. Uh, Raywood's a great one, turns brilliant red in, in the fall. Uh, drought tolerant, low water user. Um, when you do water, you know, give it good big drinks, but it, it's not something that needs to be watered every single. Like the land one in California, I'm telling you, that they grew like a weed, and they're so strange. And she just brought up, uh, yeah, she just brought up a, a, another point I wanted to make is uh, how fast do you want this to grow? We want everything tomorrow. Yes, we want everything tomorrow. <laughs> you know, if you want something that's going to be big and fast, you better ask which trees are going to grow the biggest. If you're wanting a slow-growing evergreen like a pine or something, you might want to find out either which ones grow the fastest or buy a much bigger tree rather than getting a little you know, five gallon like this because you'll, you'll be waiting years and years to see this get large. Um, so you definitely uh, want to think about what you're planting and we have so many choices out there. I mean just look at the from one side of the garden center to the other we've got trees and then we've got trees over here. We've got trees out in the parking lot. We've got choices. You can definitely find something that is uh, you know beautiful and it fits your, your needs uh, and, and uh, your resources and will fit in that spot. They come in all sorts of sizes, everything from six feet to 70 feet. I mean, we've, we've got whatever it is you're looking for, we've got it. Uh, so just ask, you know, I, I come into the list. I'm looking for trees that are drop tower, that are fast growing that get to this height and no higher, or get to a minimum of this height. And we'll help you make that happen. Uh, the uh, next thing I wanted to go into is uh, planning ahead for the care um, of the irrigation. Big issues uh, all the time is irrigation. <laughs> she's, uh, she's one of our regulars, can you tell? <laughs> Uh, irrigation, uh, you've got to plan ahead. You've got to have, you know what you're doing five years from now, right now. You really do. Because so often someone comes in and they've got a tree that is still on the baby bottle. The irrigation comes on every couple of days. It runs for 15 minutes. And, you know, it, you know that's a baby bottle every two hours. That's, that's basically the equivalent in, in the tree world. Um, you know, that works when it was a baby, but now that it's much bigger, it needs to have less frequent meals. Just like us, we don't eat every two hours, but when we do eat, we have bigger meals, right? Uh, you know, the trees drink the same way, and as they get bigger, they need to be watered less often, but they need bigger drinks. And quite often someone comes in, and I ask them, how many emitters are on that tree? And it's, and it's right next to the trunk. And it's right <laughs> on the trunk. <laughs> And I've seen it where the emitter, because the trunk has grown bigger, now the emitter is almost touching the trunk. And uh, it's rotting away the bark because the water keeps running over it. And they're having issues with the roots, you know, rotting away. Trees starting to turn different funny colors and it doesn't look healthy. And they come in and ask me what's wrong. And I ask them, how many emitters are on there? There's one, there's maybe two, and there should be five, six, seven, eight emitters on the tree. Uh, and another thing, a ground covers and shrub, this is a big one. Uh, when you plant a ground cover or a shrub, make sure that you can adjust it later because as any kind of tree, shrub, vine, ground cover, anything, when you put it in, 
uh, you're going to have the emitters right up close to it so that um, you know, it goes right into the root ball because the root ball has been confined to whatever the pot size was. But then as it grows, you need to move those emitters out and add more emitters to it. But if this isn't done ahead of time, uh, if it isn't planned ahead of time, what happens is the plant grows over the emitters and over the system, and now you can't get to the part that you need to and the, uh, to cut into the line further back to change it would require major digging and a huge process that could turn very expensive if nothing was planned ahead. So again, this is one of those things I see every day. Someone comes in and asks me what's wrong and how do I fix it? And then they realize they can't fix it without going into this huge expense. So uh, you know, these, are, these are problems that I, I literally see every single day. So that's why I, I like to tell people ahead of time, if you have a chance to uh, plan for this, how am I going to change that system when it's time to update? You actually should be updating your system or at least checking it every year to every other year for clogged emitters, um, whether or not you need to add more emitters, increase the watering, uh, decrease the frequency of the watering, you know, all of that. You're going to have to change that from time to time. So definitely plan ahead for that so that it's easier to do when it's time to do. And you had a question. Um, the trees generally have the feeder roots at the drip line. Mm -hmm. Is that true for plants, herbaceous plants, and um, yes, it is. plants, everything? Yes. So everything over time should be watered around the drip line. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So Ella, what you mean? Yes. Since we're trying to tape this, uh -huh. and, and everybody in the audience may not be heard on the tape, okay. could you rephrase oh, the sorry. question, please? Yes, yes. You know, you know starting for the future here. Yes. Yeah, I, I forgot all about that. Thank you. So uh, what she was asking about was the drip line. And what she means by the drip line, let's take this for example. Uh, the, in this case, now, right now, the here's the roots. Because it's been confined by, by this pot. But when this actually grows out uh, into where the roots want to be, the roots will always go just a little bit beyond uh, where the edge of the canopy is. So that's here. And here's our drip line, and that's where the the where you actually want to put your emitters around the tree or the shrub. And as it grows, you'll need to move those out and then add more emitters so that they're going all the way around. I don't need to go into uh, you know how to set up your irrigation and everything. We have a whole class on how to do that. But uh, because this is landscape design, um, you're the ones that are going to be able to plan ahead for these things instead of trying to fix them as they come up. Uh, you can plan ahead with your irrigation and uh, you know, avoid these problems in the first place if uh, everything is set up in such a way so that you can change it later as you need to. Uh, so, you know, the, we kind of went over, uh, you know, what kind of plan we're trying to make, you know, taking into consideration uh, the shape of plants, the, uh, the shape of trees, and how they affect the overall look of the house. Uh, uh, you know, planting in such a way so that the shapes work with the shape of the house and the shape of the yard, uh, the curves of the yard. Not all of us are on flat land, so we can take those into consideration. We talked about uh, how to plan ahead. So now I'm going to turn you over to Rich Olson. And it's right, uh, right back here. Rich Olson is, yeah. <laughs> Rich Olson is a, a designer in this area that. Um, uh, he, many of you have seen him here on Wednesdays. He's been in this area for many years, designing landscapes, does fantastic work. He's going to help you uh, see how to make out a plan. He kind of went over the, the goals of the plan. Now he's going to tell you how to make the plan and turn it into reality. And then if you decide that uh, that's not something you want to do, he can actually make the plan for you because he's a fantastic designer. And he's got some really cool software so he's going to tell you about that he uses so that you can see the concept before it's even planted. The point is that <laughs> Ella made some points that we see in landscaping all the time. Anymore, about 60% of what I do is ripping out landscapes in Prescott, Arizona. During the boom here, uh, especially in Prescott Valley, what Ella said was true, people put in globe willows, cottonwoods. Why? The de developers did it because they're fast. They're fast growers. And they want to sell neighborhoods. They're not thinking about when you buy the house 15, 20 years or so. 
the bulk of what I do anymore is tear out landscapes and start over, and you hate to do that, but it's what just happens when you don't plan a landscape. Um, instead of having a growing investment that makes you money, and that was one of the things that, how does a landscape make you money? Well, when you, when you built your home and you landscape it properly, your landscaping should be coming into its own, fully matured in 20 to 25 years. Trees still growing, of course, but that landscape, if it was planted right, plants weren't put too close together, that's too close together. This Selvia Gray guy, eight to 10 foot centers is the proper spacing. They have these grow because they grow six feet each or five to six feet, so you're gonna plant your plants. That, that didn't happen, and, and, and so, we go in and we're ripping out scapes. There's nothing more you can do in the scape when you've got five blue spruce and a globe willow in the front yard and we're 25 years old and they've overgrown the space. What do you do? You start over. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what I'm gonna do is we're, we're short on time is give you a little view of uh, uh, a landscape and how to, I'm gonna give you some basic principles that work on every house. Um, so the goal as a landscape designer, we'll deal with the front entry here first is to bring your eye to this. Let's look at this as a, the garage, sidewalk, front door. I want to lead your eye to that front door. Okay. So what we saw a lot here in Prescott with these kind of lots is just random plants planted all over. There's no design, there's no flow, there's no, uh, you've got plants spotted all over the place. You might have a blue spruce, a single blue spruce planted with a, a purple plum you see a lot of, and people thought there was nice contrast, but it really doesn't work, but we, when, I, when I was went to school, we were taught shapes and forms and how to group them together. So evergreens, typically, we, we put in groupings of three because you want the planting as wide as it is tall, and plants grow together in groupings in nature. So, so does a purple plum work with the blue spruce? Well, you'll see that a lot. The blue spruce was planted here, and now it takes up a 20-foot <laughs> diameter of the already small front yard and it's getting scraggly, you can't see out your door, then you've got the purple plum over here, it's a round shape, the colors don't work, the shapes don't work, so we spend a lot of time studying shape form. Okay, so, so the plants are important, but that's not where I start, so, so let's take this simple landscape, but the rules apply. I want to draw your eye to the front entryway. As you come up and you're a, you're a homeowner, or you're, you're coming to visit, wherever you're parking, my whole goal as a designer on the front is to bring your eye to here, We'll leave out water features and all those other bells and whistles. But we also want that flow. So how do you create flow? And I'm from a different part of the country where people use berms and, and grass, unfortunately, but that's, we've outgrown that. But we still want to do, we just don't want a gravel yard. So I'm gonna still try to achieve some kind of flow. How do I get that? I make some lines. I'm gonna take a line like right here. This is the art part she was talking about. This is real simple stuff. But we just took that lot, we just took this uh, very uh, straight line lot and gave us some curves. So now, what I will tend to do here is, here's my, here's my new planting bed. It's truly a foundation planting, so I still want the eyes going here. So I start out here. Say if it was a shady area, this would be a beautiful little tree. You want something that's not going to dominate the corner, but approximately the rule of thumb is we'd go, we'd have a plant that didn't get any higher than three quarters of the way up down the house. So we're not dominating the house. And then we stagger our plantings down in size. So we're, we're going to go with those two to three foot uh, plants like the Indian Hawthorn. I use a lot of those. So we're going to break into here, space about six foot on center. And uh, then I go to my next lower story plant the two to three footers in here. So what I've done is I've scooped, uh, we've taken the height of the, the plants and scooped it right down to the door. So your eye follows the height and it does, it really does. You could trick the eye. So you're planting at the space properly, six, seven feet on things like uh, Indian Hawthorn, I'll still put at least six foot apart, sometimes more. So the plants grow into a nice grouping and I always use three and four and sevens and odd numbers. So. Now out here, I'll tend to go with the real low plants, could be a spreading evergreen. The lower plant story is out here, a boulder or two. This is a border, uh, either a nice brick border or a, a concrete edger. Out here is gravel, in here is gravel. Well, we, I, 
I, I don't even do turf a lot anymore because of the cost and the, and the water issues. But I still do the bed lines. I don't like a, you know, the just random planting. So I want to leave your eye. And I also, the little tricks here of, of, you know, the same with the planting out here. There'd be some plantings out here. You want the plantings in scale and you want to, I would have a bed line out here. Wind is getting to me here. And uh, a few boulders out here and a few very low junipers or spreading evergreens. Everything out here would be very low. This would be burned up. I mound, I undulate, I use boulders. So, so we look out here and we look at our terrain. I just try to recreate that within within the lot. And so of course some, some of you have homes out in certain areas where you've inherited uh, a lot of pine trees and rocks in there. That's a whole different bag of landscaping, but the whole idea is, is still to complement the architecture of the house. Um, we could do classes on colors, and but I always berm and I always get undulation because we look out here, we live in the rolling hills, so I pull that into the scapes. A lot of boulders buried properly in groupings of threes and fives and uh, surface boulders if possible. What do we got? Oh, clips, good. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's settling down. so. Let's, let's do some questions, and, and I'm here every Wednesday, I sit right over here. Um, if, you, if you email me first and send me a, a little picture of your property, it takes me about a week, sometimes I can get it done sooner. It's been a real busy the last three weeks, like this late spring came and hit us, so. Uh, anyway, any questions about your landscapes? I know we, we met this Wednesday, and you've got a unique situation. So, I'm going to go out and actually look at the analysis house, but any other questions out there? Issues you have or problems? Yeah. My whole front yard, I'm building. My whole front yard is going to be my septic system. Yeah, well, so, yeah, you're limited. <laughs> so, if you're worried about depth. You're worried about what now? Depth. Depth. You know, getting into that septic system? Yeah. Um, how deep do willow trees go? Yeah, you can't even. No septic yeah. systems and willow trees, we just, you can't <laughs> even talk about that. They're, 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 the, they're just like that cottonwood that sent roots over 50 feet to find a little water feature. So, the, it's could just put, not a... Could I put those in a creek? Uh, a seasonal creek? I don't think willow trees belong in Arizona. That's just personal <laughs> opinion. And I love willow trees back east. And I love them by the lakes. And I love them where you've got water and you've got... You know, they just seem to fit. You know, I personally don't. If you're talking weeping willows and you're talking globe willows, messy they break easy in the wind i never use them ever ever i'll use the desert willow which is a different tree altogether it blooms it actually is a desert tree but anymore you know water harvesting and landscape design everything is shifting i'm doing more stuff more redos than ever before that's tearing out these trees that were planted too close together planting up them nothing was planned nothing was planned in this town and i was here in the 80s it boomed and the landscapers don't know the plants at that time any better than anybody else did. It's just that petunia looks great, pop it in. Who cares what the globe bowl looks like in 20 years? Because, you know, they don't Can think about it. Can you reuse those trees that you're pulling out, or do you have to cut them out? No, they're just, uh, there's more trees coming out of Prescott Valley and places where they were planted too tight. So now, when we talk about the value of your home, try to put your house on the market when you've got, you know, these little lots with a, a blue spruce that takes up the whole, this part of the yard and a globe willow and your yard is, your house is gone, it's buried behind the petunia and you see so much of that and I can drive down any street in Prescott and see that. And so 60-70% of the landscaping is being torn out little by little as new people buy and don't want to see that start over. So unfortunately, that so sort of that landscape growing in, in value, it's devaluing your home. So there's where the money is, is kind of landscape that's coming into its own in 25 years and it's still growing into itself, and you only do that by spacing. But the biggest thing with builders and most homeowners is, and I'm telling you the truth, I've been doing this since I was 18, actually, and they want to plant them like this. You know, this, this looks good now, but this, this salvia in three years will be, you know, one salvia is going to be six feet. So you get this, you've got to space properly, and you've got to be patient with your plantings. And they grow fast here, so. Anyway, that's that's a lot of what I see. Feet. Huh? How long do you get? The two or six Three to five feet. years? Nine. Yeah. Three, and probably faster because we're watering here. We have a longer growing season here. So things grow fast here. It's a, you know, we, we just, 
it's a lot uh, faster than back east or where I'm from. So you've got three months more growing season. So it's just the biggest thing we see. We want it. We love our plants. So I do it differently. I mean, I, I was taught how to space plants, and we spend a lot of time on plant material, proper spacings, and let them grow in. That's how your property grows in value. And then not just the random plant things. I mean, your, your, your landscape has to have... I got a nice compliment when somebody, somebody, a landscape company was installing one of the plans I designed, and it wasn't, it's not complex, it's not expensive either, to get rhythm and flow to your yard. How do you get that? You don't get it by just plopping plants everywhere. You, you have to establish lines, and you establish lines, and you get a, a, a rhythm and a feel for the landscape. And if your beds are in scale with your houses, you want to incorporate the landscape so it's accenting the architecture. And I do that with colors and textures and scale and all those little nuances don't spell big dollars, they spell you're thinking out your landscape. It is a piece of art and it's just by incorporating certain rules of, I mean, if you, I, I walk into people's homes and I see beautiful interiors and I, go, and I see this horrible landscape outside and go, it's the same thing. You wouldn't put that piece of furniture with, with this piece of furniture, you know, I mean, these, you don't do that in your home and the landscape is just the same thing, it's just an outdoor room. And we look at, you know, there's our ceiling. How are we going to create our walls? Do we want to create a screen here? Well, if you don't like the RV you're looking at right there, then you might want to do that. <laughs> but, you know, so it's just, it's, to me, it's just like decorating a room. So we use color, scale, balance, harmony. And, and, and I hang my pictures in, in that bush. I look at, you pick a, a, plant, a plant for, I don't like stark contrast. I like, I like real, um, for example, I don't like using two colors of rock very often, but but say in this little simple bed here, I've firmed this, I've mounted this, I've got some boulders, and I want a slightly different color so this bed pops out over this one. What I do, and I did this a lot in Prescott Lakes, is I took two same gravels, but different sizes. So I use a half inch black cherry here and a three quarter out here. So I have the same rock, just different sizes, but you get the, you get the visual difference because the texture's different size are different so those things are nice it's just real simple landscaping it's just everything works with the house your, your, your home is is uh, the main feature and everything is geared at accenting and flowing and pulling your eye in certain directions that's just simple basic scaping right there so are we, how are we on time well we still have battery so if you <laughs> want to keep going <laughs> I, know, I know we pushed a little late so um, any questions any more questions where, where do you live at between Sedona and here, I go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes if I'm working here a lot, I stay over here. So sometimes that's weeks at a time. So yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> you got a question? I do. Um, I live in that community called Hidden Valley Ranch. Yeah. Which is off the White Spot. Yeah. East Homestead. Yeah. And we're looking to do the renovations of our activity center clubhouse. Yeah, I know. I know where it is. Yeah. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Oh, then you know how. Fabulous. Rich, you want to rephrase what she's saying because this is. A... She has a. We're uh, talking about the, uh, the community center and, and Hazel Parkway being overgrown and one of those landscapes that needs to be addressed and re looked at. Yeah. Okay. And it started out this building, the slope in the back is so high that swales are all run and it's, it's uh, built in 1979, finished in 81. Yeah. So it has that 70s look of it's got yeah. junipers are us. <laughs> and, and they're just, you know. And, and it's so sad because it's not been fed properly, it's not been watered properly. Um, so a lot of it has to, I think, really be pulled out. And there's some beautiful rock sculptures that are yeah. all overgrown with the junipers. So I think yeah. you know, it's just down the road from me, I got I got a call to redesign this whole Sunrise subdivision right on the golf course in Hacienda because the same thing. It's just this was done 15 years, 20 years ago, and it's just a mess. So if I get your card, it's that, and I call from the corporate. Yeah, you're talking about major redesign work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I, I just represented. I volunteer at the activity yeah. centers. Yeah. My... Start with start with redesigning it. And what, you know, what I do, and I, here's, here's the thing is, you know, what, what I do is because I can tell somebody, don't put that blue spruce there. And I, well, I'll show you how it's going to look. So I, I look at things like this. It's real simple. If I'm going to do, it's not that I don't like spruce. It's just they've been used wrong here. I'll it a lot. So 
the rule of thumb with anything that's pure metal is pointing towards the sky like that in a pyramidal shape. The rule of thumb is, and if you'll note this, just look around you, you see it. Evergreens don't grow by themselves. I mean, ev ev the, the, the conifer pyramidal evergreens don't grow alone. So it looks really strange. When you have a low house, like a rambler, let's just do a little rambler house here, and you have a low roof and you've got a, a spruce tree that does that in the middle of your yard, it dominates your yard, and you've got two lines here. I hate that. See, I don't like the, the contrast in lines. That's not a contrast. Um, it, it clashes. You have a tree that's dominating your home. You never want your home dominated by your plant material, so you keep them in scale. Uh, we, we were taught, like you look at nature, evergreens grow in groupings, threes, fives, so we want to plant groupings, odd groupings, and we plant them to make them look natural. If the tree gets 35 feet tall, you plant them 35 feet apart, so the plantings are as wide as they are tall. And that's all, all the stuff you learn when you study scale and things like that. So, again, you have um, your plant material placement is probably the most overused, wrongly used thing in landscaping today. It's just not knowing this little cute guy will get eight feet across in three to five years, depending on how much water you're giving him. So, it's a huge issue. Is there any other questions? Back there, yeah. Do you have any tips for uh, shallow or poorly draining soils? Say that again, sir. Do you have any tips for shallow or poorly draining soil? What are you trying to grow in that soil? <laughs> That's my question. Anything? <laughs> I think I'd go raise, but I think I'd raise my beds. I, what I do a lot with berms, okay, I make my soil. I make my mounds. I might plant, you know, I like to plant in berms. It's easier, number one. And I like to get the undulation, so you're bringing in the rolling hills from, from uh, you know, our, 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 the beautiful mountains you live in, into your yard. So I build above the ground. And I learned that in Texas. The soil is so shallow and rocky and full of caliche. Everybody builds in berms. We go right over it. That's what I would do. Yep. How high does the burn need to be? Scale. <laughs> as well, to grow plants. Mm -hmm. plants. Yep. Yeah. Again, of course, depend on, the plant. depend on the plants. But, you know, so if you've got a really poor soil situation, you're going to design plants that are going to be geared to grow, uh, that, that thrive in more native soil. So, you know, we don't have a lot of things here, not like some places, but. I do. I mean, do you? You've got I really do camp too, Valley. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you just got to eat that's that pervious layer of lime. Caliche is a buildup, and it's, it's, I looked that up <laughs> about years ago. Impervious layer of lime that builds up, so it's like concrete, and you got a jackhammer through yeah. it. So this becomes an issue for plant material, and there are certain plants that do better than others in caliche soil, so but in building berms, it's not going to work for your big major trees. It works for your shrubs and stuff. It works for your shrubs, and eventually you can bust up that things you can do to bust up that layer of lime so the trees almost grow the roots about that far underneath the soil miles and miles they're growing sideways yeah, yeah. to get water <laughs> yeah and you just go with your fingers and right there they are. Mm -hmm. right. and what trees are growing behind you locusts and yeah. ash your locusts and your ash are doing okay and the Austrian pine did never do that yeah on a burn about three feet yeah, yeah. You gotta bust out that caliche. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you get down there with a jackhammer. Standard piece of equipment in certain parts of Texas. <laughs> just to get through the caliche. Yeah. You go from birds. Is it uh, soil throughout or is it just put uh, sort of a level layer and then the soil No, I, I use, uh, the question was is when building mounds, and I do it on every job. I just, every job. I build burns. Well, not every. But if I had my way at the end, uh, yeah. so because I want the undulation, I want to make it look like a golf course. So I don't use any rubble. I want the, I, you know, and basically the plant. It's just I do it more. The plants take off faster. They're easier to plant. Uh, but I like the I like the golf course look at the undulation. I like pulling what we already have out here, rolling hills, into the scape. So it's just it's for aesthetics, and it does help the plants grow. So and, it, and also when I'm burying my boulders. You know, you can have your boulders just plop. Boulders are great. I mean, I, I looked all over this week for a client for surface boulders, and my God, getting a lot of surface boulders up here for close to $3,000. So 
we got to get creative and find some other ones. But, but I, you know, I want those. I want those. I like the berms because I like putting my boulders in where they're buried, not just plopped on top of the ground. So, yeah. So it's all a look.